today we're going to be hearing from Olive. Um, her talk will be about 25 minutes, but there's no rush. Uh, yeah, then there'll be time for discussion afterwards. Um, we're recording the session and it will be available to watch on YouTube afterwards. Um, I put a link to the um, YouTube series in the chat where you can see the previous seminars. And yeah, so with that, I'll introduce Olive. Uh, Olive is a neuroscientist who previously worked on central pattern generators in uh, frogs, which is really cool. And also a game developer who's designed a number of different games, including uh, Crescent Loom, which, uh, yeah, I'm excited to hear more about today um, for lots of reasons, but uh, we can talk about those afterwards. So yeah, over to you, Olive. Thanks. Cool, thanks so much. Um, yeah, so Crescent Loom, kind of like the elevator pitch for it, is a game where you kind of like stitch bones and like joints and muscles together into a body. And then you have to weave a biologically realistic nervous system in order to get it to move around uh, with like a big focus on kind of like the holistic uh, way that the system works. So it's like you can change like a single channel and immediately see how the animal's behavior changes. Um, so let's see, who are we? Uh, like Marcus said, my name is Olive Perry. I use she and they pronouns. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in uh, neurobiology that I got from Reed College. Um, and I'm collaborating with Eric Zornick, my old thesis professor at Reed, uh, and Elizabeth Leninger at New College of Florida. Uh, they've been helping me with kind of like the educational aspects of the game. So like we've built the game and now adapting it to classrooms and kind of like for use in, I guess like mostly we've been aiming at introductory biology, um, but like I've heard a few people like use it as low as like middle schools and then other ones like using it as like really like basic, like kind of like a sketch pad uh, in like higher level courses. Uh, the project began in 2016 um, via a crowd crowdfunding campaign. Uh, I raised enough money to just like work on it for a year full time. Um, and it's been a side project for all of us kind of since then, after that year. Uh, so the problem, kind of like where this started, is that like neuroscience is complicated. And like while learning it, I had like a big problem, like keeping everything in my head, where it's like, I'll like see these like CPG diagrams and be like, okay, like it's like in this state, and then like this neuron changes over here, and then like it switches to this state. And like, it's just like all very like, static and it just like seemed to call out for some kind of like better tools or better representations um and since kind of like my background is in game development where i've been like just doing it on the side uh the game seemed like a really good tool to solve this problem um and so it kind of like all came together for a head uh for me during my senior year uh, when I read a paper by Eve Martyr um, that kind of showed how neurons had like kind of uh, distinct intrinsic, intrinsic membrane properties that gave them like different properties for use in making central pattern generators. Uh, so it really felt like this was the key. This is the key that I needed where it's just like, okay, these are kind of like the basic building blocks of central pattern generators. They're kind of like Legos. And like, if we could assemble them in some way. So uh, like here in one of my computer science courses, we use this program called Logisim, which used and, or, and not gates. Uh, and you can just like wire them up and get like functional Turing machines and stuff. Um, and that was just like such an effective tool at learning the basics of computer science. I wanted to do something similar for nervous systems. Uh, Spore is also another kind of like inspiration for the game. Uh, where it's, I think it was like released mid 2000s. Um, and it's this game where you kind of like snap together different body parts to like make an animal. Um, for them, like it just kind of procedurally generates all the animations and stuff. So there's like no nervous system to speak of. You just control it with like the arrow keys. Um, but it's like very approachable um, and very popular still. Like even though you know, it was released mid 2000s, like people are still making creatures in this poor creature creator today. Uh, so it was just like really obvious to me that there's like something here, there's like rich ground for making like a spore sort of thing, but like making it for neurobiology. 
Um, so what does the game look like uh, today? Uh, there's kind of like two main phases of the game. Uh, the first phase is like you make a body, just like in Spore, where you're snapping together these different body parts, like spines, tails, mouths, um, and muscles. And then you animate that body by opening up this kind of like blue hexagon breadboard. Uh, each one of these like little red diamonds corresponds to a muscle on the creature. And then you can just place down like uh, pacemaker cells, for example, um, and like connect them uh, with reciprocal inhibition and then just like have them drive behavior. So you can see here in this like, you know, eight second GIF uh, that you can just like make a functioning nervous system for a creature. Uh, just like very, very quickly. Um, so I think we've done like a pretty good job at that. Uh, and so here's a more complicated creature, uh, something that like has a little bit more going on. Uh, we still have reciprocally connected pacemakers, and then they activate muscles kind of like down each lateral side um, in a wave. And you get kind of like a more sinusoidal motion here. Um, I'll talk about this more later, but we also have uh, eyes for input. And this is basically like a Breitenberg vehicle, where an eye on one side makes it turn in the opposite direction. Um, and so you can get basic navigation again with a very, very simple nervous system. Uh, you can also see all the membrane properties and the neuron properties of the selected uh, neuron, um, where these are all the different channels that are active. Here are different options. So you, I have like a couple of presets to just like change basic membrane properties for it. So you can make the pacemaker like fire faster or slower, may have the plateaus longer or shorter, et cetera. Um, and so here's kind of like what's going on under the surface for this thing. So I'm using a two compartment model. Uh, so this is a circuit diagram with uh, batteries as the reversal potentials, uh, resistors for the relative conductance of sodium and potassium. Uh, so as channels open and close, the resistances on these um, resistors change. And then you have a capacitor here, the model, the membrane. Um, and so back in that last slide here, what you're seeing uh, right out there is just the um, uh, voltage across this capacitor uh, for this particular um, cell. Uh, yeah, what to do. And so we have a couple different pacemakers or a couple different kind of like Legos, like building blocks. So this is that like initial promise that I was talking about with Eve Martyr's paper, where you can just like, you have this kind of like palette, this like menu of different neurons you can put down uh, with preset properties. So like a pacemaker fires with endogenous bursting. Uh, you have can have post-inhibitory rebound um, where you inhibit a cell and then it fires a short burst. Um, you can have a plateau neuron, so a little bit of excitation will start to cause it to start spiking until you inhibit it, and then it falls off. And then spike frequency adaptation, uh, where under continuous excitement, it fires slower and slower. Um, and there's also a uh, kind of like a, a flex neuron uh, that you can kind of like build your own properties. Uh, so I just like give you kind of like a basic menu for each one of those things I just mentioned. Um, things like spike frequency adaptation. Uh, queer current is another uh, name for post-inhibitory rebound, this friend, um, also called IH. Uh, queer is kind of like a more antiquated term, and I like it because it's like very short, and I think it's funny. Um, so it's just kind of like stayed in there. And all, the, all of this behavior is driven by channels on the neuron. And what I mean by channels is kind of just like a basic set of rules. Uh, you can see a script for one of the more simple ones up here, voltage-gated potassium channel that has a conductance for when it's totally open and a couple of rules for when it opens and closes. Um, and then you can see the readout of the, like the current states of all of the channels on this neuron. And then it calculates like the total conductance for each, uh, uh, each ion. Um, which, as we saw, drives electricity around that circuit back there. Um, so that's that's kind of how the simulation works. Uh, so different tools that we have, I mentioned before, we have sensors. Uh, so you can basically make Breitenberg vehicles. Um, 
with basic navigation, you can see this one here navigating through kind of like a twisty maze of corridors. Uh, we also have touch. So like little whiskers, when they tap on something, they'll activate. We have orientation. Uh, so it's kind of like a array of six different neurons that activate at different like um, angles. And then a keyboard neuron, if you want to just like make a feature that you can like drive around uh, like a normal video game character. Uh, so here are a whole bunch of like different creatures that people have made. We have almost, I think, like 5,000 in the public uh, directory. Um, there's a, just a ton of different body types and like ways that things move around, uh, things that I would like have never have expected. So you have like creatures that are like walking along the floor. Uh, you have like these jets kind of. Um, so like they kind of like orientate themselves like a, a octopus or a squid might. Um, you got like weird wiggly things and people, the like brains that people have put together are just like, it's kind of like a, going through like on a safari, like going through um, the different creatures and like loading them up, where it's just like, okay, I have no idea what this one's gonna be. And like trying to puzzle out like how on earth this thing works. Like somebody put a ton of thought into it, um, but like I couldn't really explain it. Um, and let, without like kind of like going in and it feels like finding a new type of animal in the wild and then be like, okay, how does this work? But like everything's a good model organism here because you can just kind of like see <laughs> how it's all working and like, you don't need to like stain for different neuron types and stuff. Uh, one of the biggest success stories is a creature that was made actually just like about a month ago, uh, where this creature right here has multiple context specific behaviors and even simple memory. And what I mean by that is you can see it kind of like swimming normally. It has like an escape reflex for when both eyes see something. And it also has basic turning only when like one eye sees something. Um, so it can like both kind of like avoid walls very quickly by turning around and also navigate. But like the really like piece de resistance here is that in tight corridors, like in order to escape loops where it just like goes back and forth, back and forth, uh, if it does that enough, it has this like simple timing system here where this person has put together this kind of chain of flex neurons that activate in sequence and like take a while to go through the whole sequence. And like while any of these neurons are active, it inhibits the escape reflex. And so then it can just kind of like swim normally out of a tight corner that it was stuck in where it was going back and forth. I thought this was brilliant. Uh, you can also see that it uses multiple ganglia. Uh, so it's kind of like multiple different breadboards that can talk to each other um, or do some like better organizing, more complicated systems. So you don't just kind of get like a neuron ball or bundle. So second uh, half of the talk, uh, where we've been using Crescent Loom in classrooms recently. Uh, I think like building any kind of tool here or like educational game, like the product itself is only half the story and how it's used is equally as important uh, because it doesn't matter if you've built something if it's not going out and uh, living somewhere in the world. And so I'm not going to dwell on this for really long because I think we all like understand the relative like pros and cons of like wet labs and uh, versus simulations or models. Uh, but kind of like just to give you a understanding of like where we're coming from here uh, and kind of like what our philosophy is, is that wet labs are great because you're working with the creatures in question um, just like directly. It's like one to one. Uh, but they're very finicky to set up. They take a lot of training to like run and comprehend. Uh, if you've ever tried to like pull glass probes, it can you can spend like weeks just like trying to get uh, something as basic as being able to record from a neuron working. Um, and because of that, they're kind of like hard to scale up to a full class, uh, especially if you only have like a couple of weeks to teach uh, like on. Um, like brain science. So like lots of intro classes have like muscles and like other parts of biology to get to. Uh, there are organizations out here that are doing great work and like making wet labs more accessible. Uh, Backyard Brains is probably the biggest one uh, where you can just like do experiments on cockroaches um, using like very cheap and easy to set up equipment. Um, but that's kind of like the problem with wet labs. Whereas simulations and models, they miss a lot of nuance. They're simplified. Uh, but that means that you can focus on one aspect of the system and you have like a lot of control over like showing the different variations of that aspect 
They're also very easy to scale. Uh, you can just have everybody go to like a website um, and it just works on everybody's computers. And obviously like during COVID, uh, you can, it's easier to set them up while social distancing and using remotely. Kind of like our biggest thing though, that like our, like our biggest pillar is that simulations are tools. They're not replacements for features. Uh, lots of entertainment games fall into this trap. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but like uh, where they're, the like kind of thought is that it's like, oh, we're gonna like make a game and like students can just like play through different levels of the game and then they'll like know the knowledge, boom, we're done. Um, and like, that's just not how it works. Like you cannot replace the flexibility and personalization of having an individualized teacher and peers, ignoring that as like a resource is just like a huge blunder. Um, and so the best thing that you can do is make a tool that can be adapted to different situations. Uh, everybody's going to be like wanting kind of a different thing out of the tool. So instead of trying to make like one size fits all, you make like a Swiss army knife um, and kind of like let people make their own meeting, meaning out of it and adapt it to like their needs. And so to that end, we've made kind of like a fork of the game called the Connectome Explorer, which is set up to be kind of a virtual wet lab. Uh, in it, you can like load in a creature made in the full game, um, and it hides all of the connections and the neuron types besides the fact that they're like interneurons versus like motor or like sensory neurons. And it gives them like these little three letter codes or names. Um, and kind of like with that connectivity hidden, uh, it also gives you basic, like, I guess, simulacrum tools. Uh, so we have things like excitation and inhib inhibition, where you can essentially like uh, current clamp uh, different neurons. Uh, you can ablate them with like a laser and just like take a neuron out of the uh, network and see like how the animal like starts behaving differently and like how other inputs to different neurons change. Um, and we have basic neurotoxins, so you can like drop in CNQX or like uh, by Qculine or TTX onto a uh, um, circuit and say like, okay, like if you drop TTX onto a circuit and see some neurons still kind of firing plateaus, but without spikes, it's like, okay, that's a pacemaker neuron, great. Um, and then you can kind of like identify those and like map out what the circuit is. And there's also basic optogenetics. So you can tag specific neurons um, and then shine a blue or yellow light and to basically excite or inhibit uh, a whole bunch of neurons at once. So just to give you some context of like different places that we've used it, uh, Liz's course at New College of Florida, small public liberal arts college, uh, just 16 students. Um, and students are coming into this uh, with uh, potentially no background in biology. Um, and there's only one week of content. Um, Eric's uh, classes are also uh, at small private liberal arts college. Uh, they're somewhat larger uh, where you have like four labs and like different like lab instructors like running those labs. And we spend two weeks on just Crescent Moon. And to give you a couple like different examples of activities that we run, uh, this is kind of like a good intro one where we give them a creature uh, kind of like show them the ins and outs of how the program runs. Um, and then we split them up into groups and they try to build out a connectivity diagram cell by cell. And so different groups of students like focus on one neuron and then they're like, okay, what are all the inputs that this one's getting and all of the outputs that it's sending out. And then across the whole class, they build out what the full connectum is. And so we have like different like sets of Google Slides and then all of the groups will like come together and be like, oh, like uh, Ray, for example, might uh, excite now. Um, and then another group is saying, oh, like any and Bopper like inhibit each other. And so, uh, okay, I didn't actually remember what was what, but like you get something like this uh, where each group comes up like with one of these arrows. Um, that usually like works pretty well. Uh, it's like very focused and being like, okay, like we're just investigating this like one cell. So it's not too overwhelming for a lot of students. 
Um, but you also are able to build out like an overall understanding of a circuit in a single class period. Uh, another activity that we do is kind of like the bendy activity uh, where we give closely related creatures. Uh, you can see they all look the same except they have different colors and there's just slight tweaks in their connectivity diagrams, um, which cause them to behave slightly differently. Like some of them swim way better than others. Um, and then we ask students being like, okay, can you track down what the difference in connectivity is that explains this difference in behavior? Um, and Liz and Eric kind of did this two different ways. Liz, uh, Eric did it again with Google Slides and them all mapping things out. And then Liz just gave them all different handouts and they solved them and kind of like figured them out on their own. Um, we have all these resources available. I'll have a link at the end of the talk. Uh, where you can like download these examples um, or just like maybe use them as like inspiration if you're looking to use them in your own classes. Um, and then finally, the like most popular activity is this thing called race mode, uh, where you have different creatures that either the students have made or they're pre-built. And then they like hatch at one side of a uh, map and then they try to get across to the end to this big glowing golden ball and it records the order and like the timing uh, that each one of them got there. And so a very popular activity to do is like have all the students like make their own creatures and be like, okay, do you understand uh, kind of like the system and how to make a functional nervous system enough to make like the fastest creature you can? And then like we do tiered races or like a tiered bracket uh, and like, you know, students are like cheering in biology class. It's it's very fun. Um, and you can also have them do kind of like data collection on these where they just like run multiple trials, record the times, and then say, okay, like here's the like behavioral variation um, of like this creature versus this creature. And then, you know, they can like write papers on that. Yeah, so that's the talk. Uh, all of this is available for free at crescentloom.com. Uh, both full game and the Connectome Explorer. Uh, you can also, uh, there's a link to download it for $20, and then you can just like copy it uh, natively onto as many like student computers as you want. Um, and there's also a link to the Slack channel if you want to like share notes with other educators who are doing this. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I guess we have time for questions. Thanks so much. That was uh, really clear and yeah, I just loved it. I have so many groups, <laughs> so many questions, and I'm even more excited to download it now. Um, but yeah, I'll let other people go first. So uh, Roy, do, do you have something you want to ask? Yeah, well, maybe this is a kind of a burning... Well, first of all, I thought this was so cool. Um, I'm really excited about this. I used to love Spore as a kid, so um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad to see it live on in spirit. Um, the question I was going to ask might be a burning one. I don't know. Um, can, can you use this as a reinforcement learning environment? Or, or in general, can you use optimization to like find optimal connection strengths or is that kind of thing possible? Uh, not in the game currently. Like that's been on my to-do list for a long time, but like we've never really gotten the funding or like the time to really implement that. Uh, we've like applied, I think for two grants and kind of like aborted on a different one. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like burnt out on looking for money for this game at this point, uh, but like, I'm open if somebody like had a research stipend or something to do to like add features like that. Um, but currently, yeah, like you can change uh, synaptic strengths manually, but it doesn't happen um, like organically, like there's no mechanism. There are modulatory synapses, so you can like change other strengths of synapses incoming um, when like a connection is active, but like that doesn't really change the weights baseline. It, is it open source by any chance? It is not, but only because I haven't really had a good reason to make it open source. It's written in kind of like an obscure programming language. Um, and so it would like take a lot of setup, I think, to like get somebody else contributing, uh, I guess, like, well. Though so you can make your own channels. Um, and so this is just like written in like a little again, very obscure programming language. 
uh, but like if you download the game, you can just like write your own channels or, or like write your own scripts in a text editor, plop them in, and they'll show up in the game. Okay, yeah. I mean, open sourcing, it could be a way to get people interested in contributing things like um, a reinforcement learning extension. My my background is as a programmer, and I do a lot of open source, so I, I would definitely check it out if you did open source it. Cool. Noted. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Go ahead, Karin. Sorry. So yeah, I, I was gonna ask Rora's question, but he got it first. But I have a second question. Like, it's, it's a physics engine, right? Like all the movements, all the interaction, are based on Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics. Yeah. Uh, well, I should have put in a GIF of this, but um, as like kind of every time step, it's calculating the uh, forces on each surface of the creature. Um, so like there's like drag calculations and stuff. And it just kind of like so happens that wiggling something with a high drag tail makes something go forward. So like that's not pre-built in uh, to the engine. It's just like I can have a general purpose uh, underwater-ish physics engine. I had a sort of a related-ish question to the other two, um, which, which is, I guess, about, yeah, instead of uh, learning the weights through gradient descent or reinforcement learning, like, it'd be so cool to have, like, a, some sort of evolutionary thing built in. So uh, just... People people have said this a ton, and, like, the thing that I've always said is, like, I'm not interested in seeing what a computer can generate. Like, okay. I'm interested in, like, the intelligent design part. Like, I, okay. I'm making a tool for humans to understand how these networks work and like it's just it's a trap that I see so many other games like fall into where they're like oh we're gonna make an evolution game where it's like mm -hmm. what happens is you make like a interactive like or semi-interactive like fishbowl where like you press mm -hmm. a button and like see a screensaver like of the computer like making some like cool stuff I guess um, yeah. but like I'm interested in people kind of like internalizing it and like making their own models it's like why Legos are I think a better toy than like a pre-built action figure, right? Okay, <laughs> so it's a good point. But I guess there would be ways to, there would be, for example, you could imagine like with some of the classes you showed, you could imagine that like you evolve a creature and yeah. then you have to figure it out it's connect home, right? Or stuff like that. Um, or yeah, you could also idea. tweak stuff like, you know, uh, if you evolve like two things in the same environment, like, you know, does the solutions they end up with is that like very different between the two mm -hmm. um if you evolve creatures in different environments do you end up with like different circuits different body plan i i, I think there would be ways i do see your point though it's more about understanding um so, so then I'll, I'll ask a sort of question a bit on that which is um so yeah i just did the tutorial online and it's kind of amazing seeing these circuits which people have developed which really allow for like quite complex behaviors like do you uh -huh. have a feeling for how people design these like do people is it trial and error or through trial and error do people get a good intuition about how to put the circuits together um yeah, yeah so I, I mean i guess just anecdotally uh mm -hmm. i hear like people being saying like oh i got like really high and like spent 10 hours <laughs> making creatures um and just like hyper focusing on things so i think like that's like one way to approach it. Um, other people have like brought this to conventions and stuff. And like, you know, so I've seen the first like 15 minutes or like five minutes of someone playing it, you know, hundreds of times at this point. Um, and that's like just different people approach it in different ways. Some people like click around and like make some big snarl of neurons. Other people are like very thoughtful and like place one neuron down and then like see all the sorts of different things that it could do. Um, I think I think it just kind of like depends on like what type of person you are. Um, I didn't touch about on this in the talk, but I also have like a, a series of kind of like step by step manuals. So kind of again like Lego instruction building kits or like IKEA manuals, where you can just like page through and see how to build a creature step by step. And I found that that works a lot better than making like an interactive tutorial in a lot of ways, uh, because then people can like do their own variations. And I'm not just like chaining them to saying like, uh, you have to like place this body part here. Um, and also like when something goes wrong, 
they have to go through the process of like figuring out what the difference is. And like, I feel like that's where a lot of learning happens. Um, like a troubleshooting and be like, okay, how's this broken? No, so, I have another yeah, question. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, yeah, sorry. No, no, go ahead, Kareem, it's fine. Yeah. So um, is it possible to do like all these creatures with only two types of neurons, um, cytotrine and inhibitor interneuron? Um, I ask this question because my lack of knowledge about um, the effect of different firing regimes on on um, the, the the movement. So, like, can we do it with only two types of neurons, or do we need this diverse array of neurons to achieve uh, movement? Couple different answers. One, uh, kind of like the line between types of neurons is blurry. Um, so it's like we have these different types of neurons, but you can like basically make a pacemaker by just adding post inhibitory rebound and like a plateau, for example, to a flex neuron. And then like you have a pacemaker. And so like if you change kind of like the options on one of them, where's the line between like that being a different type of neuron and just like a variation on the same one? Um, and so I feel like I had a second answer there. Um, I guess the second answer is, I'm sure there are, like, you you saw uh, this thing where like somebody like rigged together this like memory thing. Um, I'm sure if I like gave them like a better timing tool for like a single neuron, like that that whole thing would collapse. So yeah, I, I guess um. What's the word there? Is it like homomorphic, where you have like two different methods of doing the same thing, and like one of them is just like maybe takes more or fewer neurons. Um, so yeah, I, I think that like there's uh, lots of ways to accomplish something that one neuron can do by just like adding a whole bunch of like other neurons of the same type. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have another question. Is there an upper limit to the size of the brains in the creatures? Like how many neurons can they have? I, I guess there's a computational limit somewhere. Um, so I am not like a computer scientist. So this is not the most efficiently coded uh, game in the world. Um, the I guess like hard limit is the space that you have available. Um, let me see. So... Uh, you can like keep adding ganglia, whoops, uh, along kind of the rim of this until like it just like circles the whole thing. Um, I don't usually see people going more than like four, maybe five different ganglia, um, because like the kinds of like uh, behaviors that you can like get using this engine um, that are interesting don't usually take more than like that many neurons to get. So we you get run into like other limits on the tools first before saying you're out of neurons. Um, yeah, and the uh, game also like starts to run slowly if you add like four or five creatures together. So those hexagons in the outer rim are separate ganglia analogous to the large hexagon in the middle? They're all- Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, okay. I'm just gonna pull open, let's see, the game, because I feel like that will- be a better explanation than like trying to describe it. Come on, don't break on me now. Everyone's watching. Um, well, of course it breaks when it's like this. Why is it doing this? Uh, just run it locally. So yeah, so here's the brain and you can place sand neurons kind of like in these ganglia and switch between them like that. Are there connections then between the ganglia? Can they yep. influence each other? So I can drag it to kind of like one of these corners here. And so this is like the ill neuron. And then I can, on a different one, click that, select that neuron, and then drag it into here. And so mm -hmm. if I do that. 
these two neurons or pacemakers are now going to fire out of sync or like in anti-sync because they're inhibiting each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh huh. So have, have people like recreated the pyloric rhythm and stuff with this? Do you know? I do not know. Um, I have like been at like conferences and stuff before where like somebody is describing some kind of like circuit and I'm like, oh, I bet I could like build that in Crescent Loom. And then like, you know, I sketch it together, you know, in about like five or 10 minutes um, of the rest of the talk. Um, I think, I think I actually vaguely remember when I was running the Kickstarter, I sent it to like Eve Martyr's lab and somebody there said that they had tried to sketch it out and like it worked, I think, but that was years ago. I had, uh, I think maybe one last question for me, at least, unless, I mean, there might be other questions from other people. Um, but you said, you said something just before, I think before the talk, maybe just when we were talking, which is, um, which really stuck with me, which is like this circuit is made for this body. Yeah. And so I guess what I was, what it got me thinking about was like, I guess there are simple circuits um, in Crescent Loom which work for like all sorts of body plans. Mm -hmm. But then I guess it's sort of that. Yeah. It's like, to what extent are the sort of circuits which you can generalize across lots of different body plans? And to what extent do you really need to tune the circuits to match the body plans? I think there's like some like basic patterns, like, Probably the most common one is reciprocal inhibition, where you have two pacemakers inhibiting each other. Just because it's so useful to have two kind of like groups firing out of phase. Um, and that works for a lot of very simple body plans. The more complicated a body plan gets, the kind of like more variations that you need to do, or like you need to assemble these different micro circuits in different ways. Um, or if there's like different behaviors, like you saw, like um, that one I showed in that slide uh, to, to do online. Yeah, the context dependent uh, memory. Yeah. Um, which is, uh, yeah, really amazing. Someone managed to build that. <laughs> hmm. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So like, even though that's like a very simple body plan, um, it has like, you know, a ton of these microcircuits kind of like assembled in sequence and like talking to each other. Yeah. Any other questions? Great. Well, I think if there's uh, no more questions, we can all thank Olive for what was um, probably the most fun talk we've had <laughs> and also super interesting. And yeah, I mean, from the questions, it's clear there's a lot of interest in using it in uh, yeah different ways. So yeah, thanks so much, Olive, for taking the time to do it. And thanks everyone for coming. Um, we have another speaker for next month, uh, which you can see on the website. And yeah, thanks so much, everyone.